Justin told me yesterday I need to challenge myself more, so this is a good challenge for me, sitting in the middle. Uh, so for folks who weren't in the room yesterday, I am Laura Reynolds, and I'm going to be uh, facilitating today's panel conversation and the discussion that follows. So the um, title of this session is Laws and Incentives to Promote Adoption and Standardization. So we talked a lot yesterday about some changes that need to happen, and we're hoping that all of you all here on today's panel can help us think about what carrots and sticks we might need to help make those changes happen. So we have a great panel with us today. We have uh, Ray Bereshansky, the Deputy Secretary of Health from Pennsylvania Department of Health, uh, Jeff Coughlin, the Senior Director for Federal and State Affairs, Healthcare Information Management and Systems Society, Amanda Fuller, who, uh, Fuller Moore, who is a public health preparedness, with Public Health Preparedness and Response Division of Public Health, North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, Devin McGraw, the Deputy Director of Healthcare, Health Information Policy, Office for Civil Rights from Health and Human Services, and uh, Mark Overhage, who is the Chief Health Informatics Officer at Cerner. So welcome, panelists, today. So uh, I guess let's get started off by, if you could each tell me a little bit about your, um, when you hear about medical countermeasures what, uh, and the work that you do, how does how's medical countermeasures factor into what you do? It's interesting because in prim primarily my experience is in state and local government, and right now it's in state government. And when I think about medical countermeasures, I'm thinking about the cooperation and the communication needed and the things needed from our stakeholders, whether those are federal stakeholders who are above the state, for lack of a better term, or even our local stakeholders, whether that's local public health or local emergency management, who we're gonna need in order to make a utilization of medical countermeasures a successful utilization. So I guess the first thing when you ask the question, the first thing I think of is communication and cooperation. And the fact that we all just can't do it alone. Amanda? So um, I've had several different roles related to medical countermeasures up until Friday. I had been um, <laughs> the medical countermeasure coordinator for North Carolina for 11 years, and on Monday I started as their interim bioterrorism coordinator, and at the end of July I'll move to a different position, so i am kind of looked at it from a lot of different perspectives, especially recently. Um, <clears throat> For me, I started in a hospital, and I started with um, a trip to Katrina uh, for 25 days, and so that was my first hands-on experience, and then to go to the state level and see that there's a lot happening, but the communication is the key. You know, making sure everybody gets the message, but not just the message, the message that they need. Um, because a lot of times we are sharing information amongst other states, but that's not the information that our locals need, and that's where the action is happening, and so making sure we're communicating in the way people need that communication. And I come at this, I guess I um, <coughs> spent 25 years in academia and uh, have done some work in uh, event detection and those kind of things over that time, and about five years ago, moved to industry for one simple reason, and that was to be able to do things more at scale. And I think that's sort of one of the things that's relevant for me here is that uh, Cerner Corporation is a large multinational health information technology organization, is very focused on how do we enable uh, folks at the local market, uh, the hospitals, health systems, and, uh, and clinicians to do what needs to be done to help support these activities. And increasingly, one of the ways we do that is by uh, providing tool, the ability to distribute and push tools at scale and to aggregate data at scale. Uh, I was talking to uh, Rich Platt earlier this morning, and he was talking about a study that he had done along with some of my colleagues at Cerner, and uh, it's coming out soon, hopefully, uh, in sepsis across five or 600 hospitals worth of data. And, and bringing that scale, uh, maybe bigger scale than that for, for uh, an event, hopefully not, but, uh, but bringing scale to uh, solving some of these problems is what I hope that an organization like Cerner can bring to the conversation. So um, uh, Ed, uh, I'm Jeff Coughlin from HIMSS, and uh, I, I think the role that HIMSS uh, plays is 
um, is how we, f how we frame it as a, a cause-based organization that's really focused on using health IT to enable healthcare transformation. And I think um, the discussion that we had yesterday about all the different pieces uh, of, the, of uh, the healthcare community and bringing it all together, I think, is something that's very relevant to the discussion today and talking about, as Boris talked about, solutions. Um, the, uh, the thing that I'll emphasize is, uh, you know, I, we work at, in the public policy team at HIMSS um, to try to bridge the gap between government, both the federal and state level, and, and also the, the, the legislative, uh, the end of things, to communicate with our members, to communicate with the community, and, and try to um, uh, help folks understand directionally where, where things are headed, um, where some opportunities are, where the challenges are, and what we can do to, to try to bring the entire community together. I'm Devin McGraw. I uh, am the Deputy Director for Health Information Privacy at the Department of Health and Human Services, which is within the Office for Civil Rights. That is the HIPAA office in HHS. So we set policy and enforce the HIPAA Privacy Security Breach Notification Rules. So where we're relevant in this conversation is that we regulate most, but not all, of the potential data sources that you're where the data resides and will be collected that's gonna be needed in order to do the monitoring and assessing of medical countermeasure use. Um, we have provisions uh, governing the sharing of information for public health purposes, which are fairly permissive. We're not, we're not though, the uh, set of rules that require the disclosure of this data, but we provide pathways um, for it to be disclosed. We also have regulations around how you de-identify data. Um, should you need to do that? It's not required, but certainly if um, the de-identified data has uh, fewer, if any, regulatory constraints associated with it. But we, we actually set standards around de-identification and prescribe some methodology. So if you're covered by HIPAA rules, um, you need to know those pathways in order to be sure that the way that you're sharing information or analyzing information, et cetera, um, for these purposes is uh, consistent with the law. So. Yesterday we spent some time um, making sure that we understand the scope of what we're, we're talking about over these two days. And we're really focused on understanding how medical countermeasures uh, after an event, how they may do harm or uh, benefit to the intended uh, populations. Um, so we're really focused, as we've said, on monitoring and assessment for safety and effectiveness. Uh, so what are some of the ways that, that policies, formal and informal policies, um, get in the way of doing that? I can start off with some thoughts. <laughs> just. Um, and Devin was just talking a bit about this. I think that, and this is across the board, it's not just with public health events, but uh, with patient care. I think that the level of education and awareness of uh, the individual actors on the ground uh, are limited and, and can be improved. So it's not so much a policy, big P kind of thing, as a, uh, that I think that folks are uninformed and, and just take it a step further, and I think this is a common public health theme, is, is we, I think one of the best ways to address that is for us to begin to practice that every day. So uh, the things that we do for, whether it's syndromic surveillance or, or electronic lab reporting or whatever it might be, that those are great ways to help people get smarter and, and more aware of what the, the regulations are, what the possibilities are, uh, what the implications are, instead of waiting until an event happens and then everybody's throwing up their arms going, oh my gosh, what do we do? Uh, so making it an everyday practice is one of the best ways, I think, and especially given uh, the, the turnover that we see in healthcare organizations. You'll educate one uh, privacy officer at hospital X and three years later you come back and it's four different people later and, and you have to start over. And so that's why I think this ongoing make it an everyday practice is really important. So it's not so much a new policy or a new change in that, but as helping people understand what the policy enables and work through the, the risks and concerns before you have a crisis. And how is this expressed at the state or local level? I think for us, one of the things that I'm saying, you know, I 
came from strictly a pharmacy world and um, about 10 or 12 years ago there started to be really a focus on medication safety monitoring and <clears throat> people started realizing how many events there were related to that because they started to monitor it. It didn't mean that there were more, they just started monitoring it. It just hadn't been the focus and I think in medical countermeasures people have looked at what was referred to yesterday as the last mile as literally the period at the end of the sentence. Once they got the medical countermeasures out there almost like they could wash their hands of it. They had done their part and they were done. And I don't think people have really caught up to there is still the road we have to travel after that. And part of the problem with that is that the tools that people are being measured with, um, the item of this monitoring and assessment is one of close to 80 items that they have to complete. And so it's, that makes it seem small. I mean, when you're looking at a checklist of 80 items and you're talking about one or two or three, it, it just makes it not a focus because you've got to accomplish these other things. And in North Carolina, and I'm sure in every other state, you've got your very metropolitan areas where you've got millions of people. And I mean, in North Carolina, we have counties of 3,000 people and three people in the health department. And so economy of scale there, figuring out how to do that is also a focus for us in trying to figure out how to accomplish that, move people's attention to <clears throat> the period isn't actually after you operate your pod. You still have to keep going. I think to segue off of what Amanda <clears throat> said, which was really good, thank you. Um, when I've worked uh, with state governments, I've often looked at their uh, statutes in regard to uh, public health emergencies. And uh, time and again, one of the things I've noted is uh, a distinct lack of statutes or statutory responsibility authority, excuse me, in regard to things like monitoring and assessing medical countermeasures. And clearly, um, I work for Pennsylvania now, and when I look at our uh, broad statutes regarding public health emergencies, it's about our responsibilities or uh, authorities in a declared public health emergency, normally dealing with things like quarantine, isolation. Um, I think some had to do, yes, I'll look at my notes, some actually had to do with immunization. Um, but I looked for specific statutes in this regard. I looked for laws about this, and they are lacking. And it's, it's interesting to me because we speak about the big P policy, but also the informal policy, the way things get done, for lack of a better term. And we look at that on multiple levels. Clearly, we're looking at that at local level, state level, and federal level. And uh, it's right before this panel began, I was having a brief conversation with some of my peers from uh, ASTO and NACHO, and I said, is there a template that goes out to states that could enable legislation to make statutes such as this? And we all kind of had the same uh, feeling, which was, no, but that's something that we all should work on together. So when I think about this question, I think about it from that state statute uh, perspective, and uh, unfortunately it is, for lack of a better term, lacking. Yeah, I would, that's, I wanna um, talk about that for a minute, because while HIPAA sets federal law that governs, again, many of the entities who will be using data, contributing data for this purpose, state law also plays a very strong role, and it does so in two ways, one, is that HIPAA doesn't preempt stronger state laws from a privacy standpoint. So if there are state laws governing particular types of health information, placing uh, greater restrictions on its ability to be shared without the express consent uh, of the individual, then the entities that are governed by that law are gonna hit a moment of pause at a minimum in order to wonder whether this is information that can be shared. And then the second way the state laws come into play are it, it, to rely on the public health permission in the HIPAA privacy rule, which allows entities covered by the rule to be able to use and share information for public health purposes, it, it is very much reliant on the scope of authority for the public health entity involved. So if you're dealing in a state where the public health authority is fairly constrained, 
or they're there then then a sophisticated compliance officer within an organization will question whether there's enough permission in the law for them to be able to use the information or disclose it for that purpose um, you know lots of folks will if they are less sophisticated not reading you know our regulations to the letter they say well public health you know I can release it anyway it creates a bit of a dilemma for us on the enforcement side if in fact the authority for the public health department to to be able to seek and use that information isn't quite there in the law but it uh, I doubt that's a case we would necessarily want to pursue we like for entities to be able to share information for public health purposes and if they're reasonably relying on the assertion of the public health authority in doing so we're you know we don't want to touch that even if it turns out that they were incorrect right this is, this is not a space where we want to be robustly enforcing oh you you disclose that helpful piece of information for public health purposes and you should not have but nevertheless I think if the state laws provide that authority and pathway and it's clear um, it just it does sort of reduces the skids the reduces the moments of pause allows the information to flow without without any uncertainty <coughs> So you mentioned earlier that um, communication and coordination is an issue for dealing with MCMs. And I'm curious to know if y'all are seeing other big P or little p policies that um, interrupt or inhibit communication and coordination at, at, across any level. Uh, I, I would uh, just say that I think one of the clearest signals that we've gotten from the new administration and from uh, the leadership at, at the Department of Health and Human Services has been focused on uh, reducing burden on clinicians at the point of care to try to ensure that clinicians can be have more face time with patients, have um, uh, focus less on administrative tasks. So I guess the, the, the kind of trickle down effect of that is if there's uh, if if there is a reduction in the requirements maybe for reporting how, how what what does that do to our entire effort around medical countermeasures and, and public health emergencies and and you know reporting and, and assessing and so on so um, I think that kind of remains to be seen where exactly that that falls in terms of what the requirements are from the federal level but um, I think that it, it's something to kind of uh, keep an eye on there uh, I think that we'll talk about uh, the meaningful use program we'll talk about the requirements and in, in the quality payment program related to public health reporting and so on uh, uh, but if those if those requirements for reporting are are reduced or lessened what what sort of impact does that have so just following up on your question a little bit I think one of the things that um, I always uh, find interesting is is and I'm no expert in this space, but sort of the dual role that public health provides, and especially in this example. Uh, in some ways, if public health is in, a, in this kind of an emergency, may well be acting in a provider capacity in essence, right? They're delivering care, they're providing an immunization, uh, dispensing a drug. Uh, and and you know, then of course we have the other sort of, what we usually think of with public health hat. So I'd be curious, Devin, uh, you know, the implications of, of these two hats, I've always found that an interesting challenge that on the one hand, uh, you have the public health exceptions and so on, but they're also providers in a lot of ways. And we have broad authority uh, to share information as providers of care for individuals. Now, we, we don't often think of it that way. We think of it more often as providing care to populations but you still do population care one patient at a time. <laughs> so. Right. No, I don't, I don't know that it, it really doesn't change the analysis much, but certainly um, I recognize that it creates yet other moments of pause, right? Some uncertainty. Well, well, maybe does HIPAA now apply to the public health authority and should it? And the reality is, is that the, the coverage of HIPAA is, is fairly constrained, right? You, you, most of your hospitals, most of your physicians, and all of your health plans are going to be covered by those rules, and then the vendors that they work with are largely covered as business associates. So the rules are going to govern how they use and share data. But once they've sent it out the door, such as to a public health authority, what that public health authority does with it is not 
first of all, the entity that sent the data is not responsible for the subsequent use of it as long as they provided the data in a way that was HIPAA compliant with the public health authority, whether they're then treating people with it, um, using it for operations, analyzing it from a quality standpoint, using it for surveillance, using it for learning purposes, is of less concern to the entities. So the fact that there may be public health departments that are actually doing both surveillance and treatment doesn't change the equation um, at all. But, you, but what you're saying does point out um, another piece of uncertainty that I certainly, that we certainly have heard in the office, and which is, when is sharing of information like in a, in a medical counter an analysis and or sharing of information in a medical countermeasure circumstance, when does it actually research, which is treated differently under the HIPAA rules, and when is it public health? And the bottom line is that we, it's often hard for us to tell the distinction from as regulators, much less for the entities who are covered by our rules to figure that distinction out as well. And you know, our approach to this is, you know, there are often times when there are sort of multiple pathways, even within HIPAA, to use and disclose data. It's almost like, choose the one that works the best for you, and certainly where there's a public health authority involved, the choice of the public health pathway completely makes sense. Again, there is this, you know, it really should be within the scope of the public health authority, um, and you can rely on the public health authority's um, uh, uh, statements to that effect if you're, if you're releasing that data. So I don't, this may, I'm, I feel like I'm talking in overly legalese here. I don't want to confuse anyone. But, uh, but what I want to say is we think at OCR that the pathways for analysis of data for medical countermeasures, for release of data uh, to public health authorities for, measure, for medical countermeasures, for sharing of data among entities for the purpose of assessing safety and efficacy of medical countermeasures are clear. If they're not, we definitely want to know that so that we can put additional guidance out that will be helpful in sort of clearing out the junk uh, in terms of people's misinterpretations and over-interpretations uh, of the rules to the extent that those are standing in the way. We do think that information can uh, be used and shared for this purpose. If it's not clear that that's the case under HIPAA, we're happy to provide clarity around that. Clear? <laughs> so um, I'll, I'll defer to Amanda. <laughs> Um, if she wanted to say anything on it, but. No, go ahead. <laughs> I'm How kind trying to think about it. It's okay. I think this just speaks to administrative preparedness for lack of a better term. Yeah. And I'm not calling it a phrase. This, that phrase was coined a long time ago. But um, public health preparedness you know, has become quite robust in the past, um, say, 15 years. And we've seen things that we didn't think we would see. We saw responses to public health emergencies and emergencies that impacted public health. And those are two different areas. And we've seen states, locals, and the federal government stand up um, in a unified manner and do great things. But um, you know, I feel like I'm the guy who's saying, <coughs> but then there's, um, and I pointed out before some of the things that were lacking in regard to potentially uh, state law, but administrative preparedness is an area where we may not be as robust as we need to be. That was about as diplomatic <laughs> as I get. Um, we may be lacking in regard to administrative preparedness, and this conversation, this question, speaks to that administrative preparedness angle. Um, yes, it is related to medical countermeasures, and it is related to dispensing, and yes, but it is about administrative preparedness, and uh, this is one of the facets of administrative preparedness where potentially we need to dig in a little bit more and say, if and when there's an emergency, how is this going to be impacting our response, and will we be able to do the things after the period, after we dispense, that we need to do? Will, be, will we be able to get the information that we absolutely need to get? I, I think we also spend a lot of time, you know, we've seen this in other responses. It, it happens in North Carolina. Um, the state health department, we are a decentralized state, so we're separate from our local health departments, and the 
primary authorities lie at that local health director's level, but a lot of the surveillance and the investigation does happen at that state level. And so getting the information from the hospital to the state to the local or the hospital to the local to the state, there's oftentimes a lot of what you were calling those pauses. It, can we share that information? When can we share that information? And we have had a lot of delays in the past in getting information that we needed from the investigations that also became federal investigations. Um, I know Paul Peterson mentioned yesterday the fungal meningitis um, outbreak. We had a lot of trouble there getting and sending and passing around information that we needed. And so that administrative preparedness is a big problem that's <clears throat> not oftentimes been the focus until you get into something and you realize, oh, yep, I figured out how to get those pills to those people, but I forgot about figuring out how to get the information I needed. Um, and so those barriers, that administrative piece is something we need, even at our state level, we need people to take a minute to figure out and getting them to realize we don't want to wait until that emergency to figure that out. We need to take those times now and have those conversations now about how to get that information past that information, make those contracts happen, and getting them to do that today when they're still trying to meet your end, this, that, or the other, is, a, is an issue that we run into. So we've talked a lot about <coughs> the need, not necessarily to create new policies or procedures, um, but to educate and enforce the ones that exist and make sure that they're being uh, enforced are interpreted properly. Are there any other um, nudges, incentives, laws, standards, protocols that you think we should consider as we're trying to, as we're thinking about monitoring and assessment for MCMs? Is there any desire at all to reach into data sources that are less traditional? Um, like one that I think is not, I mean, apologies for not having been able to attend yesterday, but. You know, there's an awful lot of data that gets collected by consumer-facing technologies like wearables, like this watch I'm wearing on my wrist, um, social media, social uh, networking sites, um, and and those would not be covered by HIPAA, which frankly means that they have, you know, depending on the policies that they set in their own user agreements, they have quite a bit more freedom to be able to uh, share this information. Not, not to say that HIPAA doesn't provide the freedom, but, but the absence of any regulation whatsoever, it, I, I <coughs> completely recognize, has a freeing effect uh, on a lot of entities. So I, you know, it, it occurs to me that while that is in no way a substitute for the traditional sources for mm -hmm. medical countermeasure, both collection and analysis, as well as sharing of data, it, is, it does feel like it's another potential resource, again, depending on the emergency and what type of information might be most valuable. Um, and it is, you know, they have um, an expectation from a federal standpoint to be transparent with users about how the data are accessed, used, and shared, and then to honor those commitments. And, and the Federal Trade Commission is the entity within the federal government that enforces that. But, it's, but it is a much more fluid environment rather than um, a bit more prescriptive in terms of the way that HIPAA handles that type of data sharing. So, so I don't know whether that's, you know, whether the, all of the people are at the table who might actually um, be able to contribute um, some value to this network. Yeah, we definitely uh, talked yesterday about using um, non-traditional data sources. So it's, it seems like one uh, suggestion that you're offering is that we look for data sources that aren't under the purview of HIPAA and think well, about how we in could, addition to, in addition to, again, yes. I'm not, I'm not at all suggesting that, so please don't take it this way, that HIPAA creates so many barriers that you just forget about that, those data sources. That is not my intent at all. I, again, I think we say fairly clearly, but acknowledging that not everyone appreciates or fully realizes this 
that you know, data can be shared for public health purposes without the need to first get consent. You, know, you can use what's a limited data set, which involves data that's less identifiable, but, but identifiable PHI is acceptable to be used for this purpose. Um, you know, whatever additional clarity that we think might be helpful as you know, we continue to sort of um, highlight or build initiatives to, to make sure that this, um, that medical countermeasures get, you know, appropriately prioritized, you know, we're happy to help in that regard. I just think that it's an add-on, not a substitute for. What other nudges come to mind for people? Well, a long time ago, I heard a very intelligent man say, preparedness is about relationships. So I'll uh, spike that and say, this administrative preparedness is also about relationships. And traditionally, I think about the relationships with the locals. I think about the relationships with other state stakeholders, and I think about the federal government. But it's very clear from what you just uh, laid out that in regard to information, in regard to data, we have to expand our own definitions of relationships as well as we expand our definition of the information we need and where we can get it from. Um, frankly, I'm sitting here right now as you spoke and I'm make, make, making a mental list of those entities that I could think about that are outside of the norm in regard to traditional public health and where I could get additional data and information from. So uh, I, I guess I'd say thank you. <laughs> So I'll just add that um, uh, there, were, there was a law passed late in the Obama administration called 21st Century Cures um, that had uh, some, uh, a lot of biomedical innovation provisions uh, included, but there were some health IT related uh, parts to it as well that I, that I think are very relevant in terms of um, a, a, a formal federal definition now related to interoperability and also uh, a definition and, and some parameters around information blocking. So the Office of the National Coordinator and other parts of HHS are right now working on um, the uh, rules and regulations around that, how that's going to be defined, the devil's in the details, I, I, I guess it's fair to say uh, in terms of that, but I think that that, it, when, when I think we think about um, uh, what the laws are and what the, what the rules are, I'll, I'll go back to the point of of uh, you know, what the requirements are and, and, uh, and uh, defining what, what the playing field is, uh, it, it, I think will help promote uh, the sharing of information when, when, it's, when it's necessary for, for these type of uh, incidents. So we all know that change isn't that easy. And I think a number of stakeholders have come up over yesterday and today. So we've talked a lot about federal, state, and local, and within the federal, the range of, um, of entities that guide our work here. We've talked about uh, private versus public actors. We've talked about researchers versus practitioners versus policymakers. Um, could each of you share a little bit either about the stakeholder that you represent or one that you think is critical to this conversation and uh, talk a little bit about their values or motivations or loyalties, what, what stake they have in this issue? This one could be somewhat easy for me, but you know, that's, whenever you say that, you know you're getting in trouble. <laughs> um, so I work for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania Department of Health, and uh, clearly our goal is to serve the constituents and the visitors to the uh, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and to make sure that they stay and remain healthy. And in this regard, um, we look at uh, medical countermeasures as a critical component of public health preparedness. And we look at public health preparedness as something that we must pay attention to on a consistent basis. And I think that when I uh, examine the ramifications of a public health emergency, or as I said before, an emergency that will impact public health. Um, I often look at it and say to myself, um, what are the, and I do try to get a little too granular, and that's to my own detriment, but I do look at it and say, how will it impact our state? How will it impact the states near us, surrounding us? How is it gonna impact a certain area of our state, a county, even a town? And I feel that that's the way I I look at it and the Commonwealth or the Department of Health looks at it and says, how can we possibly make our communities more public health resilient? And uh, that's 
clearly in this particular case, we're talking about a public health emergency or an emergency that will impact public health, but that resilience is almost on a day-to-day -day basis. So I ask you. Um, we have recently discovered, as we uh, post H1N1, looking back at what we accomplished, didn't accomplish, what we missed, um, who we missed as a part of our state. You know, for us, every resident of North Carolina is a stakeholder. You know, they have a little piece of our pie that makes them a player in what we are able to get out um, from the state health department. And so one of the things that we have taken on is a community project looking at who are all the individual community leader groups and using those as a different stakeholder than our usual emergency management, emergency medical services, our you know administrative team. And we started looking at these community groups and how do we use them to our advantage, but then we come back to this information sharing and what are the, what is the information to share, not share, but what we've used it to do is to learn how to share information. Um, we had written off newspapers. Turns out there's a huge population of North Carolina very dedicated to their paper, newsprint, newspaper. Um, we miss those people, you know, and so we've learned a lot about how do we get messages to those people and how do we use them to get messages to their neighbors so that even though they're the smallest, you know, individual unit, collectively they are very large groups. And so using them to our advantage, um, we're trying to figure out how, what are the best ways and the most efficient ways to do that to engage them because that, in the end, getting to those smaller groups the, in the most efficient manner will be our key. <clears throat> Great, so we have state government, we have the local uh, individuals. What other stakeholders should we consider? So I'll just add, um, and I think this expands a little bit on what, uh, what Devin mentioned uh, in, in terms of looking at non-traditional data sources. Maybe there's a role for better empowering patients to contribute their information or volunteer to contribute their information. I, I, I kind of uh, draw a parallel to what's happening with the Precision Medicine Initiative in terms of folks volunteering to share their, their EMR data for research purposes. Maybe there's, maybe there's some sort of structure that could be created. Uh, and I know it's not a perfect data source, but when we think of kind of non-traditional data sources, maybe that's something to kind of think about um, as a, as a future, uh, future point of emphasis. Again, it's, it's, it's not a, a substitute for, but a both and. I mean, even in the All of Us slash Precision Medicine Initiative, they both have the individual contribution route, but they also have particular research institutions signed up to be participating. So the sort of very traditional route for information gathering and the conduct of research is, is still part of that initiative, even while they are doing a, a, and going to be doing more of a lot of direct outreach to individuals to say, here, contribute your data. In, in that circumstance, it's very like, you know, you just sign up and you just start sending, 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 and then the research questions will then be applied to that growing database. And in this circumstance, I think you could actually do a much more targeted outreach to folks in terms of, you know, here's what's happening, here's the type of information we need back from you, getting some, and allowing room for their feedback about information that they're noticing in terms of the impact of these measures on their daily lives that they might want to contribute in terms of understanding more about the side effect profile um, uh, and safety issues that might not necessarily have um, already occurred to, um, to some of the experts monitoring those issues. So, and, and frankly, HIPAA provides a pathway for that too. You know, individuals being able to use their right to get a copy of their information and have it sent directly to the entity of their choice. The entity of their choice could be <coughs> a public health authority, local, state, or national. Again, not necessarily the only route to get it. There are, there are lots of pathways. You don't have to choose one. You could choose many. 
As we move into um, the rest of the day in our work this afternoon, we're going to be thinking a lot about uh, ways that we can take the, the systems and strategies that we already have in place and uh, tweak them a little bit so that we can get the information that we need. What challenges do you anticipate from, from your perspectives? What challenges should we, should we think about, uh, should we consider? Security. Security. It's not important. <laughs> security, and I don't mean the health security that you're, that is one of the themes of this conference, but the fact that, you know, data collection creates cyber targets and uh, needing to sort of pay attention to making sure that the way that that data, those data are housed and stored and accessed has, has reasonable security associated with it. It's not, there, there isn't a way to have zero risk but there's a way to reduce the risk considerably. Um, because if, if you're collecting a lot of data from the public and you get hacked, it creates an enormous public relations issue for you that can have downstream effects on the trust of the public in, in this data collection, whether they're contributing it individually or just allowing it to be done by, uh, by through policies um, that support it. So, What other challenges? So presuming that, that one of the channels, as Devin said, I think there's multi multiple that uh, we might want to pursue is gathering data from healthcare providers afterwards, right? So, so people get administered a countermeasure, they're going to go see their local GP or their, their local emergency department for follow-up care of various kinds, and presumably that's some of the data we want to monitor. And, excuse me. <coughs> I've been trying to suppress that for the last five minutes, so it'll be better. Uh, sorry. Uh, so um, the uh, and so what we're doing today broadly for health information exchange for patient care, I think, will be an important part of that and exercising and extending that. We've made actually tremendous progress. Uh, we're not certainly where we need to be, but for example, the the connectivity between the two largest health information exchange platforms in the country, Commonwealth and Care Equality, that's, that's progressing quite nicely, uh, for example, means that roughly half of the acute care facilities in the country's data could be queried. Okay, good. But, but that's a technical capability that exists. There's still, as we talked about before, uh, Hospital X needs to sort of sign on and adopt. Patients need to opt in, uh, things like that to do it. And those are the kind of, again, back to my my notion of you need to practice for this every day because if you wait until the event, it'll fail, whatever it is we try to do. Uh, so I think uh, just continuing to emphasize the, the multi-purpose nature of that kind of ability to query across the enterprise or a set of enterprises uh, will be one of the things that we need to be doing. We're making progress, we can make more, and that'll very much facilitate, I think, at the time of a of need, the ability to go uh, bring together the data in a useful way. What other challenges? I'll go with the easy one, um, funding. I will say that, um, you guys went with the tough ones. Um, I will say that most health departments that I've worked with, state and local, are stretched. Uh, they're, they're working every day to the maximum. And now we're looking at potentially um, potentially either stable funding or funding cuts for some of the main public health preparedness grants that we see from the federal government. And we know that a lot of state and locals literally run their public health preparedness programs based on those. So I think that when we look at public health overall in regard to this, as well as public health preparedness more specifically, funding has to be something that we at least factor in and say to ourselves, what money will be needed by states, locals, by governments, in order to make these sort of initiatives, the moving past the silos, the security, not health security, but data security, as we'll call it, or information security, how do we move forward with money to make that a reality from the government perspective? Any other challenges? <clears throat> About 30 seconds left, so. <laughs> no pressure. <clears throat> I mean, I think I will, echo what Ray is saying, funding is a challenge. It's, um, you know, we use a lot of our preparedness funding to support things that are everyday activities, but in an emergency, they are key systems to quickly 
operating and um, a lot of our surveillance came out of preparedness and so that's the pathway for funding those things and without that daily surveillance we're going to be missing in an event key factors key pieces of information that don't just let us get to the dispensing but get to the pieces of the monitoring and assessment because our everyday surveillance systems our inpatient monitoring those are the systems where we're going to pick up what we need to pick up that it's not working or we're having major side effects the systems we're using every day are the systems we need to keep maintaining and putting into um, and finding these additional data feeds and data sources to go in there but without the funding to do that we'll just be left without that system and it'll be painfully obvious at a really inopportune time. Okay. So a round of applause <laughs> for our panelists. Thank you. You can uh, turn off your mics and leave them and then go join the group. We're going to make a little transition.